Um, so once again, Julian Lortz, because we're recording, uh, is curator from Haus de Kunst, and Julian curated the exhibition of uh, Louis Bourgeois, which we have here now uh, in Munich, and co-curator of this show. Uh, and uh, we're very happy that Julian uh, had the possibility to get back to us uh, to share with you um, her research, uh, no ideas, and uh, on how uh, Louise got this idea of cell as a structure, and how from uh, drawings and paintings it went to an installation and uh, a sculptural environments. Uh, if Канцелекция, so I'm now talking about questions. If Канцелекция, вы сможете задать Julian вопрос. Спасибо вам большое, что пришли. Передаю Julian слово. So thank you very much, um, Nastya, and also Katya, and uh, Sona, and Kira, and there's a, a huge team behind Nastya, and uh, the whole garage, uh, of course, um, very kind of you to invite me here, and uh, yeah, it's a pleasure to be here, and as, as always, it's, it's great fun as well. Thank you so much. Um, so, uh, as you can see, Louise Bourgeois, um, born in 1911, Died in 2010, uh, originally in Paris, and uh, uh, then moved in 1938 to, to New York, where she then also died at a very high age. In 1980, Louise Bourgeois, at the age of almost 70, acquired her first studio. It was a former sewing factory for blue jeans in Brooklyn, and much larger than her brownstone house in Chelsea in New York City, which was only about five meters wide and had doubled as her home and workplace for decades. It was an important step in her career, since this new studio enabled her to work on a much larger scale. The series that she, that she started to create there comprises 60 works in total, 55 of which are part of the Cells series, 25 of which you can see here in our exhibition, Louise Bourgeois Structures of Existence, The Cells at Garage. Yeah, in fact, I need to change this out. <laughs> so this quote, space does not exist, it is just a metaphor for the structure of our existence, um, is the source for the title of the show, indicating that the cells are the focus of the exhibition. And the cells are also the set at the center of my talk tonight. These works, however, are not to be seen in isolation from Bourgeois' overall oeuvre created in the previous 40 years. Since the mid-1940s, Bourgeois had developed a rich and complex artistic language in a variety of mediums, ranging from drawings, paintings, prints, and sculpture, culminating in this remarkable series of the cells, which spans more than two decades, finding its conclusion just two years before the artist's death in 2010. The cells are distinctive in their formal and spatial manifestations, while the psychological motivation behind her art and the emotional tenor throughout her work remains consistent in this series. They stand out as a major strand in Bourgeois' long career as a continuation of her artistic, conceptual, and personal concerns that were already dawning in the early 1940s. One might even trace the trajectory back even further than this, for the artist herself has stated that all her artwork is rooted in her early childhood. Uh, one work that could be considered an early harbinger of the cells is this small, untitled ink drawing on pink paper from 1943. It shows a bell jar under which a woman's head is stuck on a peak shape, the base of which is curved. Her eyes are wide open and she's smiling, laughing even, despite the fact that she's detached from her body, cut off from her surroundings, and on display like a delicate specimen to be preserved and protected from the outside influences. There is a peculiar oval outline that appears to be defining the contours of her face, but that is simultaneously hovering in front of her face. The line might simply be evidence of the artist finding the final facial shape, but considering the emphasis on the eyes and the distor slight distortion, one might think of the line as the edge of a magnifying glass or a lens, which would certainly reverberate with several of her cells created decades later. Interestingly, the bell jar, which is a motif that returns in several of bourgeois sculptures, prints, and also the cells, has itself magnifying properties through the curvature of the glass. But it is the implications of this drawing that are most striking. A woman imprisoned and yet seemingly enjoying isolation, the disconnected emotional state and detachment from the body, being protected by transparent glass that in itself is fragile, 
placed on display for all to see and yet reachable, unreachable in, their, in her confinement. They are aspects that Bourgeois elaborates further in his series of paintings. <laughs> titled the Femme Maison, literally Woman House, where she combines the naked female figure with architecture. The woman's head, and at times her upper body, is replaced or hidden by a house. The woman is consequently silenced, headless, in an impassive, static and isolated state, the face being the part of a human being where individuality and communication is predominantly expressed, where emotions are transmitted through every even minute facial expression, where cognitive organs such as the eyes, nose, mouth and ears receive vital messages. She has a head in a house, or a house is her head, suggesting that this woman's identity and realm of thought is contained within a domestic setting, and therefore defining her in the traditional role as housewife and mother, tending to house, home and children, which at the time was indeed also bourgeois role. The femme maison's lower body and genitals are exposed, but despite her vulnerability, she stands her ground, providing the house with a steadfast foundation usually expected of buildings. Although this takes on nightmarish elements in one of the paintings, where the woman's uh, legs disappear thigh high into a plane of color, seemingly stopping her from moving, and in the other, where the entire femme maison appears to be falling before a black background. There is a sense of claustrophobia, despite the windows and doors, since the women appear trapped and bodiless. This tallies with Bourgeois' own suffering of both claustrophobia and agoraphobia, to which she has derisively referred thus, I quote, I love claustrophobic spaces, at least you know your limits. Quote, end. This thematic of combining architecture, space, the body, and more of a psychological space continues in other works, such as these femme maisons, and could be said to be a major aspect of also the cells. While a house can be a place of safety, providing a protective skin, shielding the private person from the public, it is in addition a place that silently bears witness to the occurrences within. It absorbs traces left by its inhabitants, physically storing the past as a place for memories. In 1949, Bourgeois exhibited several so-called personnages, sculptures, at the Peridot Gallery in New York for the first time. You can find some of these personnages in the Wunderkammer in the exhibition upstairs. Apart from the considerable differences in composition, colouring and height, what is particularly notable is the way in which Bourgeois has placed these personnages in relation to each other and to the overall exhibition space, as these installation shots of Bourgeois' second exhibition of personages show, which took place at the same gallery just a year later in 1950. Bourgeois had arranged the sculptures in such a way that the viewer had to physically navigate the space, as in an all-encompassing installation, or as the American art critic, writer and curator Lucy Lippard wrote, an environment. Bourgeois herself remarks, I quote, instead of displaying pieces, the space became part of the piece. The spectator is no longer merely a viewer if he is able to move from the stage of viewing to the stage of collaborating. End quote. Despite the works being shown as a group, the individuality of each piece is nevertheless clearly pronounced. Bourgeois has identified the sculptures as a way of, I quote, summoning all the pieces I missed, end quote, after her emigration from France to New York in 1938. While a viewer would not have been aware of Bourgeois' personal history at this point in her career, Lippert writes that, I quote, observers remarked a painful sense of isolation, end quote. Bourgeois herself described the spatial arrangements thus. Although ultimately, each can and does stand alone, the figures can be grouped in various ways and fashions, and each time the tension of their relations makes for a different formal arrangement. All these figures do not only have a relation to each other in space, but are related to the limits of the space in which they are set. It is part of the problem of the relation of the contained and the container. It is the artist's latter remark, the relation of the contained and the container, that resonates strongly not only with the personnages as a 
as an installation, but also with the woman's head contained within the bell jar in relation to its see-through container, and furthermore, as to how the female bodies interrelate with their domestic containers in the Femme Maison paintings. In the early 1960s, Bourgeois explores this idea further with plaster and latex sculptures. Several of these works carry the title lair, a term that describes an animal's den or nest, a place of refuge and safety. Bourgeois lairs began as a series of plaster coils that spiral around each other or fold in on themselves. Built from the inside out, these organic forms give none or only limited visual access to the interior labyrinth through small openings, albeit that the title suggests an inner life. While most lairs are displayed on plinths, like, like this one would be, uh, Bourgeois unsettles the viewer's seeing experiences, uh, ex experience by suspending the sculptures, such, such as here, uh, Fée Couturière from 1963, and the the rubber, layer, uh, rubber work called Lair from 1986. In 1974, making a sculptural leap from small pedestal works to a large-scale diorama, Bourgeois created the destruction... Ah, not working again. Yeah. Uh, the destruction of the father. With its interior of bulbous forms, the work descends from the Lair series and is an early precursor to the cells. Bathed in a dim red light, a mysterious scene unfolds. Large latex shapes appear to be growing out of the floor and ceiling of a pitch black cavern, framing a central display with similar but smaller forms, which are arranged as if to suggest an amoebic landscape. These globular entities are reminiscent of the clusters of rounded organic protuberances of earlier abstract sculptures, such as the sludgy colored plaster and latex work Avenza from 68 to 69. The form's flesh color, elements such as the scattered latex casts taken from lamb legs, as well as the work's title, all add to an ominous atmosphere in the destruction of the father, which is also to be seen here in the exhibition. The impression is confirmed when Bourgeois recounts the story behind the work. I quote, the piece is basically a table, the awful, terrifying family dinner table headed by the father who sits and gloats. And the others, the wife, the children, what can they do? They sit there in silence. The mother, of course, tries to satisfy the tyrant, her husband. The children are full of exasperation. So in, exasperations, so in exasperation, we grabbed the man, threw him on the table, dismembered him, and proceeded to devour him." End quote. The same flesh-colored latex forms are at the center of confrontation from 1978, where they are displayed on an elongated stretcher swathed in shiny blue fabric like a large buffet. With a similar gruesomeness to the destruction of the father, Bourgeois called the wooden components caskets and described the table as a stretcher for transporting someone wounded or dead. The two latex shapes represent one young and one old person, as Bourgeois explained. Quid. One creature is old, and as you can see by the shape, they are crinkled. They are definitely wrinkled and old. The other is absolutely fresh, re representing youth. Each of these boxes represents one of us. We have to stop running and take our places in the circle and face ourselves in front of each other. Nothing can let us escape this confrontation." End quote. A confrontation of sorts was also the intention of the accompanying performance with the title A Banquet slash A Fashion Show of Body Parts, during which selected audience members were allowed to sit or stand inside of the wedges, as, uh, whilst different protagonists catwalked around the space between the display table and onlookers. Each performer wore a light-colored, partly see-through latex costume with various arranged protruding teats. And here you can see Louise Bourgeois wearing one of the costumes. At one point, Suzanne Cooper, one of the performers, sang She Abandoned Me, which vocalized the thematic core of the overall piece, as Bourgeois pointed out in the documentary film Arena from 1993, directed by Nigel Finch. The whole performance, she says, 
was about being abandoned. Confrontation is the first work to demarcate its own space within, within an ex exhibition setting. Moreover, it begins to control the way in which the viewer experiences the piece, both visually and physically. While one could see over the tops of the shorter wooden boxes or peer through the horizontal slits that bourgeois cut into the taller units, you might just about, I have a pointer here apparently, back here, there, you can see some of the slits there. Um, so while one can see over the tops of the shorter wooden boxes or peer through the horizontal slits that bourgeois cut into the taller units, the viewer is prohibited from entering the space. Dialogic themes such as inside and outside, seeing and being seen, the container and the contained, are being set up here and all within a space that is defined by the artist with its own rules of presentation. When I, begin, when I began building the cells, Bourgeois says, I wanted to create my own architecture and not depend on the museum space, not have to adapt my scale to it. I wanted to constitute a real space which you could, walk, you could enter and walk around in. While the personages occupied the whole room, co-opting it to become part of the work, the cells are Bourgeois' personal enclosures placed within a spatial context. Articulated lair here at Haus de Kunst uh, can be seen as the first cell in the series, even though the term cell dates from 1991 when uh, Bourgeois created the cells one to six for the Carnegie International in Pittsburgh. So articulated lair is from 1986, and uh, in the sense a precursor. According to the dictionary, a cell is defined as a room in a prison, jail, etc., where prisoners live or are kept. A small room that one person, such as a monk or a nun, lives in, or any one of the very small parts that together form all living things. Articulated lair is the starting point to Bourgeois building her own architecture, which only became possible since her acquiring the new large studio in 1980, as mentioned at the beginning. The 1980s are very important for Bourgeois, not only because through Articulated lair she had begun a new major series, but also because she met Jerry Gorovoy, who would become her longtime assistant and friend, and who is meanwhile the president of her foundation, the Eastern Foundation. And Bourgeois' first retrospective, uh, including paintings and sculptures, and such, uh, such as the Personages and Lairs, curated by Deborah Y, opened at the Museum of Modern Art, also in the 80s, in 1982. In general, the New York art scene in the 1980s was dominated by painting and photography by artists such as Andy Warhol, Keith Haring, Cindy Sherman, and Nan Golden, and also sculptors such as Jeff Koons or Barbara Kruger's conceptual art were at the forefront. Art, in other words, that addressed street life and graffiti, celebrated and questioned consumerism, and challenged gender roles. Bourgeois, though, continued to follow her very own personal themes through architectural structures. With articulated lair, she partitioned the exhibition space with tall and narrow metal panels linked together in a circular concertina that can be flexibly arranged as the title suggests. Just as the wooden caskets in confrontation, which we just saw, Bourgeois designates an area within which a scene is set so the folding screens in articulated lair separate its interior life from the surrounding space. Like the earlier lairs, Articulated lair has an inner realm, which, however, can be physically entered through two doors that function variously as entrance or exit. Bourgeois has hereby moved from symbolic to real space, from the imaginary and visual to the experiential. Meanwhile, though, unfortunately, most cells cannot be entered anymore for conservational reasons. Um, however, there are, there are some of Bourgeois' cells that were never meant to be entered. Um, but to be looked at through windows, mesh, gaps, etc., calling for a very different viewing experience. Inside articulated lair, one encounters a very different situation than its obtrusive black outside might suggest. The panels are painted monochro monochrome white, that's the predominant color, blue or black, 
and a single, very low black stool stands forlorn in the, in the center. Black rubber sculptures, some long and thin, others thick, like elongated droplets, ranging from just 30 centimeters in length to over a meter, are suspended from thin wires and hang in intervals close to the screens. In their intense blackness and rubbery consistency, they have a fetishistic feel, while their almost obsessive reiteration adds a certain eeriness. In their abstra abstract formulations, though, they are reminiscent of the personages as the inanimate substitutes for people. In sculptural terms, these biomorphic components not only add rhythm, but stand in contrast to the geometry of the architecture. Hard and soft oppose each other. Seated on one's own on the tiny stool, surrounded by the overtowering, movable elements, one, f my, one imagines feelings of loneliness, perhaps claustrophobia or paranoia, particularly since a viewer circumnavigating the exterior is able to peer inside from various angles without being noticed by the sitter. Bourgeois, however, considers articula articulated lair a safe haven. She says, The lair is a protected place. You can enter to take refuge. And it has a back door through which you can escape. Otherwise, it's not a lair. A lair is not a trap. Early on in the series, not all cells have complete explo <laughs> explosions. Um, not all cells have complete enclosures, such as the so-called precursors, uh, no exit and no escape, both from 1989. These works also make use of folding screens, which, unlike articulated lair, embrace or shield the various elements from just one side rather than, encircling, rather than encircling them fully. In both No Exit and No Escape, painted metal panels screen off the, the space behind solitary wooden staircases that lead straight up and end abruptly. And they both have secrets. Hidden beneath the stairs in No Escape, No Exit, excuse me, is a metal T-shaped stand from which two white-hearted rubber forms are suspended side by side while the interior of No Escape contains two wooden spheres. And these wooden spheres turn up in various works. For example, here in the cell, The Last Climb, which you, you've uh, probably seen because it's um, uh, in the order to, um, just downstairs, in the uh, foyer from 2008, The Last Cell, incidentally. And also um, Cell Black Days, although here it's not wooden, but they are, I believe, made of stone. In Gathering Wool, the, another precursor to the cells in a sense, the black metal partition functions more as a curved backdrop to large wooden spheres that have been, that have been placed on the ground. It seems to gather the sculptures as suggested in the title, holding them together in a spatial and compositional tension. The first time that Bourgeois uses the term cell is for her works entitled Cell 1 to 6 in Roman numerals which she created for the 1991 Carnegie International in Pittsburgh, curated by Lynn Cook and Mark Francis. The Carnegie International is North America's oldest exhibition of international contemporary art. Numerous elements in these first six cells can also be found in later works of the series, such as body parts. Here you, see, you see again, um, just now actually, I just, uh, this is the, um, well it says below, but it's the installation shot of uh, the Carnegie International. So it's a very, she's placed the works very close to each other. So it's almost like a, yeah, like a little city that you have to walk through. And Haus der Kunst, we try to recreate that a little bit. And up here as well, of course, in the garage. Um, so here you see an ear. Here on the next one, a bit clearer, made of marble. Um, other elements, spheres in wood and glass, are found beds and chairs, and also uh, Charlie Marr perfume bottles. In examining the entire series, it is notable that Bourgeois did not follow a strict successive formal development in the material used for the cell's outer shells. Rather, she worked with several recurring combinations at once, in part due to the haphazard ways in which some of these materials were obtained, as Jerry Gorovoy explained. For the most part, the cells consist of old architectural elements that Bourgeois reused and converted, different types of worn domestic or industrial doors, wire mesh screens and windows, on their own or in various combinations. 
each of these materials allowing the viewer varying degrees of physical or visual access to the interior. There are some exceptions that make use of entirely different containers in this series. Precious Liquids, for example, from 1992, um, which was first shown at the doc Documenta in Kassel in Germany, curated by Jan Hood. It, it comprises an adapted water tower that was originally on top of Bourgeois' uh, Brooklyn studio. And then formally, I do. This will work. We will have un I undo. <laughs> This way you see it longer, I'm too fast at this. And I redo, which were commissioned for Tate Modern, Modern's Turbine Hall in London. And you could actually physically enter these works and climb up the stairs. And Cell 12 Oval Mirrors from 1998. They stand out the most, perhaps, the former for the sheer towering scale, uh, each measuring between 13 and 17.5 meters in height and the latter for expanding beyond the space of the actual cell. Furthermore, these works depend on the viewer's physical participation, partic uh, partially in conjunction with mirrors, mirrors being one of the crucial recurring elements throughout the series. In several works, such as Cell, You Better Grow Up from 1993, or In and Out, from 1995, large round mirrors are incorporated in the walls or as incisions in the, ceilings, in the cell ceiling. They can be swiveled into different positions, visually expanding the cell's inner space, as well as multiplying and thereby emphasizing certain objects within the cell. Furthermore, the mirrors divert the eye, affording oblique viewing angles and details that could otherwise not be seen. Altering actuality, as Bourgeois points out when speaking about mirrors. She says, reality changes with each new angle. She goes on to explain the significance, I quote, Mirrors can be seen as a vanity, but that is not at all their meaning. The act of looking into a mirror is really about having the courage it takes to look at yourself and really face yourself, end quote. This intimate act of looking at oneself is particularly prevalent in the I do, I undo, and I redo towers and cell 12, oops, okay, next one, uh, cell 12 oval mirrors. In these works, mirrors either surround or are directly opposite seats for visitors, while others can watch the seated person is confronted by his or her own mirror image. He or she is projected and thereby integrated into the work. In cell 12 oval mirrors, this view is distorted due to the mirror's convex and concave properties. On the voyeuristic aspects of these experiences, Bourgeois remarks the following in reference to cells 1 to 6. He says, each cell deals with the pleasure of the voyeur, the thrill of looking and being looked at. A statement that certainly rings true for all the works in the series. In addition, the mirrors wantonly tamper with the, vis with the viewer's perception, thereby playing a similar role to that of the cracks between folding screens, nearly blind industrial windows, or the crisscross of wire mesh, all of which afford only partial, hazy, or distracting views of the cell's interiors. To a certain extent, Bourgeois holds back the viewer's gaze, creating a physical and visual barrier as well as an emotional distance. It is precisely this voyeuristic, distanced and fragmented mode of perception that evokes the desire to see better and more, which at the same time is tinged by a sense of illicit prying. Since Bourgeois has repeatedly spoken about her artistic motivation and expression being rooted in her emotions, memories and her past, the situations contained within the cells are indeed originally of a private and intimate, intimate nature. They appear like repositories in which Bourgeois keeps, locks away, but also revisits memories as and when she sees fit, rather like compartmentalizing one's emotions when they are too intense or too strong to deal with all at once. Aspects of Bourgeois' personal biography appears in various forms. 
in cell one from 1991, part of the cells one to six, and cell you better grow up from 93, which you saw earlier. For example, there are several empty Charlemar perfume bottles, a scent that Bourgeois wore herself. And Bourgeois' personal items of clothing are included in cell clothes from 1996, and also in cell seven from 1998, which you can see here at Garage. With cell Choisy, Bourgeois refers to Choisy le Roi, a small town near Paris where she grew up in a large house that the ho family rented between 1912 and 1917. A detailed pink marble model of this very house sits on a 19th century cast iron workbench. The building was the base for Bourgeois' parents' tapestry restoration business. The tapestries were repaired here under her mother's supervision and then sold in her father's gallery in the Boulevard Saint-Germain in Paris. A model of this house, incidentally, reappears in other cells. On the whole, there is a very cyclical aspect to the series in that several elements or themes recur, often in altered form, made from a different material or in an altered scale. The pink marble building on the workbench is squarely encased by panelled industrial windows on three sides and a wire mesh panel at the front where the blade of a guillotine, complete with a releasing pulley, is hovering high above, poised as if it might come rushing down at any given moment. Though even if the blade were to be released, it would not cause damage to the building as this is set further back. The blade would rather work like a swift photographic shutter, momentarily severing the, view the cell's content from the viewer outside. Taking Bourgeois' emotional connection to her early past into account, which she has described as traumatic but also as a source of inspiration for her work, one might think of her childhood home as a flesh-coloured container for her past and memory, akin to the Femme Maison paintings, that itself is contained by the architectural elements of the cell. The guillotine might therefore signify a brutal and deep cut of Bourgeois' past as well as the present. Further specific references to her childhood and parents' work can be found in needles, thread and spindles and the tapestries that she incorporated into the, art, into the cell series. While these items, as well as the marble house, can e be easily linked to the artist's life, the history of the recycled uh, materials also inspired Bourgeois, as Jerry Gorovoy points out. He said, the found materials informed Bourgeois' thematic co content of many cells. The water tower in precious liquids, for example, led her to think of the bodily flu fluids and their relationship to fear and anxiety. It's the big water tower we saw earlier, and it's from 92, and um, the 90s, well, the 80s as well, of course, were very, uh, uh, I say the German word, geprägt. <laughs> no, uh, AIDS was a big issue at that time, and, uh, and also Louise had, had lots of gay friends, and so for her, this uh, would certainly would have resonated within the in creating the work. Bourgeois finds other ways to address her concerns in a more direct yet ambiguous manner by incorporating text. Cell one, from again, the early series 91, is such, is such an example. Lying on a bedstead are three off-white linen French postal sacks that each have been stitched with red thread reading the following. <coughs> I need my memories, they are my documents. Or Art is the guarantee of sanity. Pain is the ransom of formalism. Drawers below the bed contain further postal sacks and one reads, pain is the business I am in. By physically inserting text into the cells, Bourgeois makes her voice explicit, adding a further layer of emotive content. The contained objects, although evocative in themselves, are additionally suffused with meaning from the text. The bedstead is thereby no longer merely a bed on which to rest, but associated with pain, sanity, and memories. In the accompanying catalog text, mm -hmm. in the accompanying catalog text, on cells one to six of the Carnegie International 1991, Bourgeois reiterates these personal aphorisms and expands on their theme. The cells represent different types of pain, the physical, the emotional and psychological, and the mental and intellectual. When does the emotional become physical? When does the physical become emotional? 
It's a circle going round and round. Pain can begin at any point and turn in either direction. While Bourgeois mostly relays her personal deliberations in relation to the works in this text, at one point she becomes more specific with regard to her biography when, almost in passing, she briefly mentions her mother's death and at the very end that she helped hide her mother's illness from her father. Despite Bourgeois candidly and obsessively addressing her past, she has nevertheless expressed an openness as to how her works are interpreted. I quote, If I am not readily understood, I do not mind. As time goes by, people will see new things in the work, things that the artist did not put there or did not know he had put there. The successive analogies or associations of subjects to symbols will be read and reinterpreted. End quote. And even though several of the cell's components are very particular to the artist's autobiography, as well as her personal memories and emotions, they nevertheless transcend their specificity. Bourgeois manages to transform objects and situations into a universal, symbolic language. This becomes perhaps even more apparent in a very condensed way in terms of scale and content in her series, within the series, namely the portrait cells that she created between 2000 and 2005. Rather than referencing particular persons as portraits are conventionally associated with, Bourgeois filled purpose-built rectangular cages of similar dimensions with hand-sewn patchwork fabric heads that's here, and objects that are hung or placed that are in, in relation to each other. Bourgeois' cage sculptures in this series seem to function as placeholders for elemental human feelings. In this sense, they are portraits of emotional states. Though Bourgeois did not start her cell series until quite late in her career, with Articulated Lair in 1986, she continuously referred to space and its metaphorical con connotations in various ways throughout her work. This is evident in her iteration of the house as a refuge and simultaneous confinement in Femme Maison, the all-encompassing environment in the personnages, or the enclosed secret interiors of the lairs. With her cells, Bourgeois took hold of the space, filling them with themes from earlier sculptures, as well as shapes and forms from her drawings and paintings, filling them with her thoughts, emotions, and memories. In a sense, Bourgeois' series of cells is the prolonged cul culmination of her oeuvre, creating a whole new category of sculpture. The cells hover somewhere between a museal panorama, a theatre set, an environment or installation, as well as a sculpture entity that in this form and quantity is unparalleled in art history. Друзья, у нас есть время для вопросов и ответов. Если у вас есть вопрос, пожалуйста, поднимите руку, вам передадут микрофон. Uh, first of all, I want to thank you for this beautiful presentation. You really opened up uh, a new perspective for me. And I want to ask you, like, you, all of us, we've seen this uh, enormous uh, spider figure near the entrance. And me, myself, when I was browsing for the installations, I was unconsciously uh, magnifying some of the subjects. You know, I was increasing them in size. So my question is, is the size really relevant and crucial for Louise uh, when she was creating her art and so on? Oh. <laughs> um, yes, I think it is. Um, because it's quite often you will find that she will have the same motif, like for instance a spiral staircase or something, which you can then find in some works, like the towers that we saw, as a massive spiral staircase to be walking up yourself. But you can also find it in cell uh, number seven upstairs as a little tiny um, model, if you like, or as a little tiny sculpture. And so I think she was extremely aware of size and scale. And I think it's actually one of, it's, it's, that's what makes it so interesting that she's, you always feel, it's like, um, I was talking to Flida Barlow, she's a, she's a um, British sculptor, and we did a tour through the exhibition in, in Munich at the time. And uh, she was saying, I thought that was very appropriate, um, is that in a sense, Louise Bourgeois' um, vocabulary is in a sense fairly small, but she manages to um, really 
work through all the different materials, work through all different scales, find different angles to it in a sense, and and so and so somehow it's it's this enor enormous over. It's an enormous over anyway, of course. But just to say that she's she's incredibly good at um, really working um, her language, if you like. So if there are no other questions, we can just thank Julien Lors for her beautiful lecture and thank you very much. Ah, yes. Ah. I, I, I'm sorry, there is a question. Okay. <laughs> Do you know how many spiders are made all together? Which spiders? Do you mean maman or yeah. do you mean uh, in general? In general, Ooh. separate standing spiders, because the most the impressive spider I saw, it was in Avignon mm -hmm. and the cathedral, and it was amazing. Yeah, but so then you mean the outdoor spiders, because of course the smaller... It was inside. Oh, it was it inside? Was, it ah, was inside okay, well... In the cathedral, then, and it was unbelievable. Uh, then I have no With idea. the old cathedral, <laughs> the spider was yeah. there, and it just... Uh, yeah. It, it gave me different perspective on all of this. <laughs> yeah, exactly. I mean, this is what it can do, that if you, if you have, you know, I think this is what she also does with the cells, and this, um, and you couldn't probably tell so much from the installation shots I brought from House of Kunz, but House of Kunz is, is re has massively tall rooms. Oh, yes, of course, you, you've been to Munich. And so, and again, you know, talking about scale, you know, uh, Louise manages to kind of give, even if you have a huge, enormous megalomaniac uh, space, she manages to make it domestic or she manages to make it personal. And so I think this is, again, back to your question, in the sense that, that scale with, with her work is extremely important. So, and I think also this relationship that you felt with the spider, similar thing, you know, where you, you suddenly maybe see the architecture as well differently. But I can't, unfortunately, I can't tell you how many spiders, I'm sorry. Ah, <laughs> uh, okay. Тогда вот теперь мы благодарим Юлиан Лорд. Спасибо большое за лекцию. Спасибо большое, что вы пришли. У нас есть еще время до конца работы музея сегодня, поэтому можно посмотреть на выставку немножко. So thank you for coming once again, and we still have some time, so you can take a look at the exhibition again from a different angle.